Anderson took about 400 move back to the outskirts of Peter Maritzburg, the capital of KwaZulu-Natal, this fine city which is home to the world-famous Comrades Marathon, which is annually run between Durban and Maritzburg, was ready. Just outside the hustle of the city centre lies Eston in the heart of the sugarcane fields. And it was here to run three of the 2008 APSA Off-Road Championship was scheduled to get going. It's an area known for great and testing layouts, which asks man and machine all the tough questions about technique and reliability. Winning here is sweet, and that's what at least a dozen teams have their hearts, minds and expertise set on. I'm Arnold Goetz, and I'm joined by fellow commentator Roald Woods. Thank you, Arnold. The third of eight races in the series this part of the season becomes defining for teams as the early teething problems should have been sorted by now and the car driver and navigator as well as mechanical combination should have gelled by now and started delivering the results. So the Nissan Sugar Belt 400 was crunch time for a lot of teams. Nissan won the pipe opener in the Western Cape with defending champ Duncan Foss, but they were put in rally-like conditions in Port Elizabeth four weeks later by Toyota. They were hoping to get back on top while Ford were on home soil. Setting the face at the top of the production car log, it was indeed Mark Cronier and Chris Birkin, while Force and his co-pilot Ralph Pitchford were just two points back. In fact, just 16 points separated the top six, and that group included four former champions. Yeah, look, I think uh, we had an awesome result. I mean, the team's been really working hard towards that, and uh, I don't know. Um, the pressure's all relevant. I mean, I've been, I've grown up with it, so if it wasn't for the pressure, I don't think I'd be here. So this is one of the tougher events on the calendar. Yeah, look, I've had a couple of good results here, and um, that's, to me, one of the toughest events of the year. Um, I find that it's, 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 it's very deceptive, you know, that uh, it starts off fairly smooth and flowing, and the next minute it's got a bit of a sting in the tail. But um, we'll see how it goes. We'll wait and see what the prologue's like, and uh, let's see what, what, where that seeds us. Meanwhile, Nissan's Francois Jordan was in with the Norwegian, Ivar Tollefsen. My Norwegian is fine. We're actually going to do Swahili and Afrikaans this, uh, this race, so we'll both look forward to it. But this was a short sabbatical for you, not so? Man, a sabbatical as long as you want to make it. Uh, <laughs> but I'm only standing for uh, uh, others, uh, uh, the regular navigator, as you know, his wife has got a baby coming, and I'm only standing. I'm not doing the rest of the season. The Sugar Belt is a tough event, though. I've always enjoyed the Sugar Belt because it is a tough event. Uh, it's got something of everything. You've got to be very sharp on both sides, both driving and navigating. You've got to preserve the car. And just when you think all is there in the pocket, you've got a big surprise coming through. It's the end normally. It's a wonderful event. In the Ford camp, there was an air of optimism. After all, it was a good start. We have. Uh, as you know, last year we didn't have a good start at all, so this year it's starting off well. We had a, th a third in Cape Town and a second down in PE, so maybe a win here. But uh, I must say I'm feeling the pressure a bit because everywhere you read it, we're the favourites and it's home turf. And so <laughs> there's a bit of pressure, but uh, yeah, it's my favourite race of the year. I've kind of like grown up in these surroundings, not on this side of town, but uh, I know the area well. <clears throat> I like this type of terrain. And of course, with all the fans and friends and everybody coming to watch, it's, it's fantastic. Eh? So it's really a special event for you? <clears throat> the best event for me of the year. It is a special event because your family comes, your friends are all here, and no, it's just great to see all the people, you know. And I th also think it's one of the best events of the year. It's a, a huge public following that comes to this event. So, yeah, it, it's a special event. For the folks in and around Eston, it, it's really a community project. Definitely. You know, all the farmers, uh, it's an old farming area. The guys that have been here have been here a long, long time, and uh, farms have been handed over during the generations. And ra off-road racing, almost started in this area so for the eastern community and uh, this whole area off-roading sort of in their blood track racer anthony taylor was back in off-road racing in eston in a toyota been through them all and uh, you know my career really started out in in motocross so you know the taste of dirt once you had it as a youngster you'll just never be able to let go of it so yeah i'm very happy to be back involved with uh, toyota once again and um Again, in the works team with, with the off-road vehicles, I think we're going to be in for, for quite a nice time. You know, it's a whole new learning curve yet again. I've done a bit of off-road previously, but it wasn't um, very successful because the vehicle that we built was a little bit trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, but yeah, I think it's going to be quite good. We'll wait and see what happens. The brothers Zamatin, Henry and Maurice, were ready to put last year behind them permanently. Yeah, we had a terrible run last year, so this year we're hoping that it's a, 
a clean run right the way through the season. You know, you need to, especially in the early races, you need to consolidate your points, make sure you've got some in the bag, not have too many DNFs, so that by the end of the year, it's not this dogfight that it was the year before. Back in Eston again, and this can be a very technical route. Your thoughts? I, I must admit, I enjoyed Shishlui very much. Um, there's no such thing as a bad off-road route. They're all lovely. Um, just varying terrain is nice. I think the last, uh, the last race we did down in the Eastern Cape was a bit uh, much of the same, you know, just corners followed by corners. This, this is nice and rough. It's technical. It has uh, good scenery. It's nice weather. It's lovely. In the special vehicle category, there was no love lost, though. Terence Marsh and Peter Krunewald in the Regent Racing Bat were atop a pile of serious chases, led by the Silvalds, Cully and Quinton. An intriguing contest was in the offing. Yeah, look, a good, a good start of the season, which just put us in a, in a nice position moving forward. Um, this event is a tough event. Uh, we know the attrition rate is high here, you know, going from the sugar cane to the normal off-road and into the forests. So, you know, we'll, we'll be aggressive in qualifying, and thereafter we'll see how it pans out. But to be honest with you, just to finish up there will be good enough for us in this one. I don't need to be too aggressive. For Quinton Sorwalt, Eston was a new experience. It's a new experience, but always fun coming, coming to a new event and experiencing new things. So looking very much forward to, to participating. No particular strategy, just getting to the finish once again. And uh, once you're at the finish, we see where we lie. And that's pretty much what we're going to try and do for the race. The start of the 65 kilometer long prologue to determine start positions for the next day's racing over 350 k's. And previous round winner Mark Renier did the honors and made quite a splash. While Force wasn't letting the grass grow under his wheels either. Multiple motorsport champion Nissan stalwart Hannes Hobla and his navigator Jean Moore in the Nissan Navara were, in their own words, taking it easy and wanted to ensure that they weren't first on the road the next day due to the fact that the route would be very slippery. As for the local outfit, Maritzburg-based Neil Woolridge and Kenny Schulthammer in the Ford Ranger, well, they had the bit between their teeth and were battling along quickly and very effectively. But would local knowledge be a winning factor for them? That was the big question. Tollefsen in the next Navarra had a new partner. But as always, the multiple champion Francois Jordan was superb. The Norwegian was also flying. Mekker and Excel dealer team of Hechu and Jaap de Brain were next. But they were almost two minutes down on the pace-setting exploits of their fellow Toyota driver, Cronier. With another Castel Toyota Hilux 4-liter zooming into view. But Arnie, look closely. Christmas and Yavi Bardenos to a sugar rush. Check out the decorations draped all over the car. Their blood sugar. And adrenaline levels. Thanks was up for sure. The two and four wheel multiple champion Alfie Cox in the Motorite SP was also in the thick of things, but down on the intermediate times by about two minutes. But Alfie and Hini Testecher know how to coax a car around. No one wrote them off yet. The next SP car interview was that of Mark Ferguson and Craig West in the second Ford Ranger. They've been improving in leaps and bounds. And so is the Ford too. Look at it bounding along. Ha ha. Rounding out the top ten, it was the Barkaisens. You mean George and Sharon, who pushed that Ruacon Toyota Hilux in their marital status to the limit. Yep, one and only couple. They make a formidable combination, that's for sure. With newcomer Anthony Taylor in car with navigator Robert Houghton in the third Castrol Toyota Hilux, feeling his way round. Taylor has a track pedigree second to none, but this was not the blacktop. Here, you need to keep things on track, though. You are on a roll. In Class D, there was a huge battle on the brute. Kutsia Labuskartny and Johan Kerber had the race on its Nissan hardbody yodeling along. But Cliffy Weichelt and Jimmy Goch in the N1 4x4 Toyota were just 19 seconds behind them. Class D was on fire. 
Luckily for Jack Beckham and Lucio Santoro, there was a little less pressure. They had almost five minutes on their nearest competition in their Ford Ranger. Ditto for the Zermatten siblings Henry and Maurice. They had a big gap over the next class D car in third place on the road in the prologue for the Nissan Sugarbelt 400. This was Peckham and Santoro's nearest markers in class E. Yanni Fissa and Jox LaRue, four minutes and 45 seconds down. And Eastern Cape winners Diebold von Breda with Pierre Mons rounded out the top three in Class E. With Rob Gurney and Paul Gonlag in fourth. But only 66 seconds further back, applying the pressure. But in the production car class, it was a very tight prologue win for Eastern Cape victor Mark Cronier and Chris Birkin, who were home and almost dry. Just three ticks of the clock ahead of the Western Cape winner, Duncan Foss and Ralph Pitchford. Krobler and Moore a further 56 seconds in arrears. In the special vehicle category, Gary Berthold and Andre Vermeulen were ready to take off. With their big turquoise Atlas Copco Porter ready for any and all eventualities. And the surprise drive of the Sugar Belt's opening day was Don and Don. That's Thompson and Blakey in their Zarco. Yes, Ali, please take note, this is a Class P car, and it was 13 seconds ahead of the next Class A car. A superb ride from the two Dons. With championship chasers Herman Silvold and Paul Helberg in their Silvold Zarco Magnum in third, just 17 seconds behind. How tight was the special category racing in the prologue? And this confirms it. SA champion Evan Hutchison and Achim Bergman were back after their horrendous crash in Bern and Darling, and they were in turn... Oh, come on, Arnie, do the honors. Thanks, Roll. Just 21 seconds back. But in fourth place... And in fifth, Nardis Alberts and Colin Hunter in the red wraps a bat. This time, I'll handle the stopwatch. They were 39 seconds behind Berthold and Vermeulen. Thank you. The Sawalt combination, Father Cully and son Quinton, were 53 seconds behind in their Sawalt transport Zarco. Then, with Marsh and Peter Krunewald keeping their word and taking it relatively easy in the prologue, over 65 k's. They were 61 seconds back in seventh place. Second in the P-Class, it was brothers Johan and Etienne Buzadenot in their Adenko bat. Then Marcus Taylor and Derek Keith shot into view. They were being chased by young crying Tiro Furcht in the Keymax Property Developments bat. Class B was also on fire. Hey, but Arnie, there was drama for Brandon Harkus and Richard Leake in the second motor ride bat in the sugar cane. They parked it in a no parking zone. And upside down too. Um, started about 16 k's ago. Uh, we're doing really nicely. We picked up some time on the front cars and um, came off a jump and seemed to land on a, either a rock or a uh, stake sticking out of the ground and going straight through the tread. Anyway, we try to carry on going, and then eventually the tyre exploded, and I think when it exploded, it took one of the brake lines out at the rear, or damaged it slightly. So by the time we got going again, uh, we're coming down this hill here, quite a pace, and uh, the next one I put the brakes on and just flicked the car left and right, like violently. And I said to Richard, no, we've got to go into the sugarcane dead straight here. And we tried to do that, and then as, as we got sort of halfway into the, the corner, it just flicked it sideways again. We land up going in the sugarcane sideways and over on its side. But there's no damage to the car, it's just a pity, you know, when you know you've, you've got a pole position, and uh, to give it away like that at the end is, is not ideal. Harker's just a little raw, perhaps. Meanwhile, Gary Gillingham and his nav VZ von Zale in their shell bat were clipping along nicely in Class A when they had mechanical dramas which stopped them in their tracks. Going very well, came to the Marshall point, pulled off, gearbox went. We don't know what has gone in the box. We'll take it out now at the pits and have a look and see if we can fix it and hopefully we can race tomorrow. So the top 10 in the specials, an amazing performance from Thompson and Blakey, but here's the thing. Only 3 minutes and 27 seconds covered the top 10. Tough, uncompromising racing. Vehicle and asset finance from ABSA. Going the extra mile to get you finance. Finance from ABSA. Going off the beaten track to find solutions. The Eston area outside Peter Maritzburg in KwaZulu-Natal had just quietened down after the Nissan Sugar Bowl 400 prologue. Then the post-mortem started. The place is going to be hectic, you know. I just see on the, all the times now. I thought, yeah, we had a good time today. We did a, quite a, a brisk pace. And, uh, yeah, the other guys were just... Uh, 
uh, going faster and maybe taking a little bit more chances, you know. It's still a long way tomorrow and uh, I think at the moment we're lying third and I think that's a good place to lie with uh, the new times that we're starting a minute apart, you know. Uh, you can creep up from the back and the guy in front of you won't know it and you beat him at the end by not even coming here first. Ford had very little to do in the pits and Schulthammer enjoyed himself. It was pretty nice. It was, uh, it was a bit of everything. Um, very dusty. Uh, we caught up to Elfie, but uh, no, it was, um, it was a nice route. Uh, different, new, not all, everything what we've done before, which was quite nice. Uh, the last 10 k's was exactly what we, but that's going to be the common route tomorrow. So it was nice. We had a few little high flyers, but uh, it was good. Cox was all smiles, but his memory had left him in the lurch. The route made it jump back. Look, it's great to be back at the Sugar Belt again, but we always forget about the, the millions of jumps that are out there. And, you know, Sugar Belt notorious for the rain uh, trenches that they use for the forest, you know, to, to, to take the rain, the water. And I think we must have done about 60 or 100 of them now in the time trial. But uh, I had a good time trial, but uh, times are not what I'd like them to be. But Tomorrow is a long day, and uh, I'm, I think I'm just being a bit too cautious in this new uh, SP that I'm driving. Well, Cronier certainly wasn't, and loved it. Yeah, we had a nice clean run. It was, uh, it was a tricky prologue. Um, the first bit was very, very fast, and I was really enjoying it. And then all of a sudden, a nice thing in the tail. This thing just started getting tight and twisty and rough. And yeah, I'd had to just take the edge off, so we'll have to wait and see what the times look like. But yeah, I'm hoping that we uh, did enough to get it to the, to the top. In Class E, championship contenders Thomas Rundle and Brian Roberts hadn't gone far when the earth hit right back. Yeah, no, this is uh, really disappointing. 14 k's in, we hit a huge, or we hit a bump really hard, and I immediately felt that we broke something in the front, and on further inspection we've seen we've actually cracked the whole part of the sh this top shock mount right, you know, chassis right out of the, the body. So, yeah, I don't know, we're going to try and fix it. Obviously, we will fix it. We'll try again tomorrow. Let's hope they do. Bertold and Vermeulen had a good day in the office. Yes, we had quite a nice approach today. We thought we'd just take it easy, make sure we bring the car home, and in so doing, we managed to put it in, in pole for the specials, which is nice. We're fairly used to being in this position. Hopefully, we can hold it there for the duration of the race tomorrow. And that's the trick. The second place crew had dust trouble. Today was very really difficult in the sense that there was a lot of dust hanging and uh, there was no wind. So hopefully, um, if it stays like this, the, the guys coming from behind will have a problem with the dust. So for me, I think we, we need to tap off a little bit um, and yeah, and see where, how it goes. And keep, keep the car together and, and bring it back to the end. The prologue route caught out many a driver and navigator, leaving them bruised and battered. Very eventful. It was a bit of a hard day in the office. Uh, we made some good time in the first 30 k's and then uh, we went over a blind rise, the road went to the left and we went straight over and we got stuck there for about 30 minutes. Yeah, we were very tired after getting the car out of there, but we made it home. There's lots of cars out there, broken down, rolled. We made it here. I'm looking forward to tomorrow. When that tomorrow dawned, it was another perfect KwaZulu-Natal day in the Midlands. And the teams, cars and support crews were ready. How did you find that right turn over there? Well, I looked up and there it was. The farming community loves this once a year gathering and the opportunity to rub shoulders with their off-road heroes. Finally though, it was eight o'clock and time for Cronier and Birkin to saddle up and hit the road. And a minute behind them, allowing for dust gaps, it was Foss and Pitchford. Krobler and Moore, only racing together for the third time ever, were getting the combination right. They were just 54 seconds behind. Cronier and Birkin were looking for two on the trot and were soon into their stride. But they had a misfire, and it was affecting their pace. Oh, 
Oh, now this gave Force the opportunity to slip, slide, jostle and bounce right up close. The defending champion was ripping up the ground and the opposition. While Krobler knew the pressure was on and the 51-year-old celebrating his 31st year in motorsport had to produce. Again, actually. Under leaden and darkening sky, Shorthammer directed Woolridge around the early parts of the first loop and the Ford Ranger was sounding great. And the local knowledge wasn't hurting either, it seemed. But there was drama for Cronier and Birkin up front. They'd done one of their tyres a mishap and had to stop and change. And that meant that the Nissans were gaining on them. Tollefson and Jordan were eating up the terra firma and moved up a place. And so did the Debrains in their Toyota. With Chris Fisser and Jan Bardenos trying to be quick, but to stay out of trouble all the same. With all the early drama going on, Bertolt and Vermeulen were under starter's orders and went slip sliding away. The two Dons were next and were hoping to repeat their great form from the opening day during the two long loops of almost 350 kilometers that lay ahead. But they would really have needed to perform miracles. There were a lot of big name teams ready to take them down. Including these lads, Hutchison and Bergman in their silver and black motorized bat Spec 3, which they had to rebuild after the first edition burnt to cinders. These men, meanwhile, had burning ambitions. Albertson Hunter on fire and pushing the wraps of bat all the way. With Herman Solwalt and Paul Helberg in fifth in the specials and trying to temper the natural instincts to want to go fast and on the other hand, conserving the car to ensure a finish. Let's go in car now with West and Ferguson Ford. And that's Krobler and Moore off the road. They'd broken a lower ball joint after hitting a rock. The question was how much time would they lose trying to fashion some sort of repair? Indeed, but no troubles like that early on for young Cry. He won six races out of eight last season, but in Class B, he's the master at pacing. And in Class D, the Race Sonics outfit was still just 19 seconds ahead of the competition after the first 10 k's worth of racing. In Class E, Peckham and Santoro were setting the pace and still had almost five minutes over their nearest competitors. Yeah, but there's no doubt about it, Arnie. Foss and Pitchford were having a banner day. Well, the fitness fanatic who does such a fine job for the Japanese manufacturers was hunting for win number two in just three outings. Yep, and with local lads Woolridge and Schultham are slotting into second after going by Cronier and then Krubler. The Nissan Sugarbelt has had a severe shake-up in the first few Ks. <laughs> Then into the more mountainous terrain, and here's where Ivo Tollefson and his stand-in co-driver Francois Jordan came into their own. Meanwhile, Grenier and Birkin were scrambling in the Castrol Toyota. Yes, they were, and almost collected an intrepid photographer when they wrong slotted here. With all the position changes, the Micron XL dealer team Toyota, the DeBrains was up into fourth and making a fist of it too. Yeah, while Bertold, who has become something of a prologue specialist, wanted to finish this one in front of the specials. He would have loved nothing more. Silvalt and Helberg were next into view and had closed the gap on the leaders and passed Thompson and Blakely in the process. That was really a great start. But the same could not be said for Hutchison and Bergman, who had steering shaft trouble and were just holding her back a bit. Albertson Hunter hadn't tasted victory for a while and were ready for a reminder. But first, they had to get to the designated service point and close some gaps. That six-letter Chev engine does sound mean, though. 
Alfie Cox and Henny Tostierka bustled by the next only motorite SP entry after having to repair a flat early on. With the men in second place on the APSA Championship log, the Sorvolts down a few places after having got stuck in the sugar cane themselves. The two Dons were still firmly ensconced in the top ten specials, and they were having a great first loop. Not even one Class P car within shouting distance, actually. Then former champion Terence Marsh, consistent, smooth, and patient. And guess what? Nothing's changed. The Regent Racing Man was doing what he's done all his career, working the car and the route well. His teammates Michael Whitehouse and Matthew Carson had either closed the gap on him, and after starting ninth, had moved up one place already. And Fissen and Bardenost in their Castrol Toyota had got it going nicely. Ferguson and West sped by in seventh place, doing the Ford cause no harm whatsoever. Yeah, but then Fisser got it stuck in the sugar cane. Luckily, stablemates Taylor and Houghton were on hand to pull them out just a little later. Meanwhile, Moore and Clarsen in their free spirit chef were also going hell for leather and doing a great job. The Adenko bat in the hands of the Bozeta notes was holding station in second in Class B. But Ferguson and West in the Ford Ranger were catching up and pushing hard. Yeah, perhaps a little too hard and... Whoa, here you go, over she goes. Luckily, no serious harm done, just a bruised ego or two. Taylor, a national title winner, as a tender teenager, was certainly enjoying his first serious off-road outing for Castrol and Toyota. And went past the stricken Ford Ranger after getting a thumbs up from Ferguson and West. Yeah, who weren't over too long before they got all four bits of rubber back on terra firma, thank goodness. It had rained the night before and some parts of the route was rather getting slippery, but Bez Vesadnot and Johanda Brain were going very well. With Cry and Fuhr closing the gap all the time to the men in front of them. They were four places to the better already. And Kutsia Labuskakni and Jan Gerber were doing much the same in Class D. Keeping the pace and the pressure on in the lead. Peckham and Centauri themselves had jumped a massive nine places overall and were 66 seconds ahead in Class E. With Cliff Beichelt and Jimmy Goff all over the back of them trying to get closer to the lead in Class D. The Zermattens, meanwhile, wanted to help Jaco Swanepoel, but a bulky drive shaft uh, wouldn't allow them. Next time, perhaps. Fussa and Leroux were running the roost in Class E, looking for their second win of the season, and we continue right after this.